Oh God, he's discovered Cardano. Sell now. <laughs> I'm kidding. Let's talk about what is Cardano, where the price is going, and hopefully by the time you're watching this video, the price of Cardano will have gone up in value. That way I can sell it right back to the people watching this video. Just kidding. <laughs> Real talk, before I started my YouTube channel, I remember watching popular YouTubers talk about the next hot stock pick or the, the next best investment. And I remember telling myself, yeah, we've peaked. We've hit peak performance, I'm gonna sell now. So I apologize if this video drops the value of Cardano, but everyone is talking about Cardano and asking me to explain Cardano. So let's talk about Polkadot. Now let's talk about ADA, the ticker symbol for Cardano, because just recently it did something pretty epic. It moved into the third position of the overall cryptocurrency market cap, replacing Tether, which was there for a while. So it's a huge step forward. If you're unfamiliar with Cardano, it's a cryptocurrency like a Bitcoin, but more like an Ethereum, except apparently it's better. So let's talk about what it is, where the price is going, and why everyone is talking about Cardano. Hi, my name is Andre Jack. Hope you're doing well. I'm still not a crypto channel, so come for the finance and stay for the crypto. It's a phase, <laughs> leave me alone. So let's talk about Cardano, why it's so exciting, why everyone is talking about it, where the price is going. But before I get you too excited, just understand that I'm not an investment expert and there's a lot of people that are way smarter than me in the crypto space. So this is just one of many perspectives. But in order to understand Cardano, we have to ask ourselves, why are there so many cryptocurrencies in the first place? Like, why do we need dozens and dozens of these things? And a really great way to understand that is to know that each of them is trying to solve some problem about the world or technology in general. In order to understand Cardano's excitement, we have to go back to the year 2008 which is also the year I graduated high school, but more importantly, it was the year when TVs were becoming larger, thinner, and also lighter. This is also the year when we were standardizing the 16 by nine aspect ratio, which is what you're watching this video on, because back then we watched videos like this. It was the four by three aspect ratio. It looked old, it was not 4K, it was 480p, it was not even high definition. So two companies began their fight to change everything. Thus began the great battle between the two technologies that was Blu-ray owned by Sony and of course Toshiba's HD DVD. I don't have a second CD, so that would've been cool though, <laughs> so we'll have to make do. <laughs> that was dumb. I promise it's gonna make sense in just a little bit, but Blu-ray had a maximum storage capacity of 50 gigabytes, but it was a lot more expensive to make in comparison to HD DVD, which had 30 gigabytes of storage, but it was a lot cheaper. So to the average consumer who was shopping at that time, it looked as though HD DVD would win because I don't care how much storage this CD has, I just wanna watch my movie. But surprisingly, Blu-ray, the more expensive one, was the one that won the battle. The reason I bring that up is because it looks as though history is repeating itself once again. And now we're seeing the battle between Cardano and Ethereum. Now, obviously, if Ethereum was so perfect, it wouldn't have a competitor with a whole community of tens of thousands of people who think that Cardano is a better technology. So to understand why Cardano is so loved, we have to look at the problems that cryptocurrencies have, more specifically Ethereum's problems and how Cardano is gonna solve them. And then I'll give you my opinions toward the end of the video. So strap in, it's about to get very complicated and nuanced, but I promise I'll break everything down and make it easy to understand. All right, so both cryptocurrencies, Cardano and Ethereum, are trying to become the best platforms for designing smart contracts on top of. Interestingly, the co-founder of Ethereum was Charles Hoskinson, who founded Cardano. So both of the technologies have a lot of similarities and goals in that they're trying to become the best DAOs or decentralized autonomous organization platforms, which remember, just a fancy word for saying decentralized marketplaces that aren't owned by private corporations. So think of Robinhood without the hood or the Robin part. <laughs> there's also DeFi, and within that, there's NFTs or Nifties or the Crypto Kitties we've talked about, yield farming, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things you can do with smart contracts, but just remember, at the end of the day, they're trying to do the exact same thing. But here's where everything changes. Now, Ethereum was the first cryptocurrency to have smart contracts on it, but it has three major problems. And the first, without getting into the nuances of how Ethereum's blockchain works, is that it's very expensive to use. So remember that bus driver analogy? I've talked about before. With Ethereum, every time you use it, you have to pay a gas fee to the bus driver. So every time the bus arrives, gas fees. Every time you open the door and you enter, gas fees. Sit down, gas fees. You sneeze, tree fitty. So it becomes very expensive, especially 
as the bus stop becomes more and more congested. And so that's an overly simplified explanation of how it works. And then you have to pay those gas fees with something called GUE, which is a small unit of measurement within Ethereum, kind of like the dollars had pennies, same concept. But this becomes a much bigger problem when Ethereum grows higher in value because then the bus driver gets even greedier. He's like, boy, man, where my money? <laughs> you can imagine then that when you're trying to test the network, create an app or build a business on top of Ethereum, it becomes prohibitively expensive to do even the smallest of things. So the way that Cardano is trying to solve this issue is by getting rid of the bus drivers entirely. They wanna make those buses driverless. And the way they do that is by changing what's called the consensus model from proof of work to proof of stake. So stay with me. More specifically, the way they're going to do that is by addressing Ethereum's second problem, which is called scaling. So you can think of scaling as kind of like our way of competing with credit card companies like Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and all cryptos have this problem. But at any given time throughout this world, for example, there are two transactions per second happening on Bitcoin. On Ethereum, it's something like 20 to 21 transactions per second, which is higher, but when you compare that with Visa, who is capable of handling more than 65,000 transactions per second, you realize we are so far behind. The reason that credit card companies can do this is because they secure their own network via something called a private database. So if this was the matrix, they are Neo. They can just step in and change the rules of the game however they see fit. Remember, one of the rules or one of the goals of all cryptocurrencies is to live in a decentralized world, meaning we have entities, companies, websites that are not owned by any private corporations. They're not governed by central governance models with shareholders and members of the board. We just live in a world that has technology that just works by itself. But the truth is decentralization comes at the expense of network security. Because if you open up your network to anyone and everyone to just do whatever they want, you're vulnerable to attack. This is why private databases are much better at scaling and securing because anybody from inside the company can just step in and say, I'm gonna put a stop to all these shenanigans, reverse transactions, and do whatever I want. They are not limited by the rules of decentralization. And that is one of the most fundamental problems that all cryptocurrencies have. The way that Cardano is trying to solve this problem is by decentralizing their network, not by proof of work, but by proof of stake, which is just a fancy way of saying that the people who verify the transactions are the people who hold the Cardano token. And they participate in what's called a democratized voting system and that's how they verify transactions. Now, when I say verify transactions, I don't mean there's somebody who's like manually looking at what you buy and being like, should we let Andre buy this avocado toast? No, this happens automatically behind the scenes based on monetary incentive. And the reason that proof of stake works better than proof of work is because we get rid of the fees associated with doing all the bus driving. Now, this next concept though is called game theory and it is genius. Now, this could be a video all by itself, but Human beings are generally greedy, and Cardano uses this concept of greed to make its network strong and secure. It's such a cool concept. So instead of miners in all the other cryptocurrencies, the reason that Cardano is safe and secure to use is because it uses this concept of greed. So for example, the people who actually verify these transactions are not miners, but instead the stakeholders, AKA the people with the actual Cardano token that verify the transactions on the blockchain. Because if you had power over a financial system and you were to vote what goes where, you would have every incentive under the sun to run your system fairly so that you can increase its value because you have a vested interest in its success. You have a stake in the technology, hence proof of stake, which is a very greedy and selfish decision that happens to secure and make the network very powerful. Cardano, by the way, was not the first to solve this or use this. Lots of cryptocurrencies use this concept, but Cardano specifically uses it to decentralize and secure its network. But if you didn't keep up with all of that, just remember that proof of stake is much more efficient, it's quicker, and it's cheaper to use, and proof of work is a less good technology. Ethereum is proof of work, 
Cardano is proof of stake. Huge asterisk because Ethereum 2.0 is proof of stake, but that's not the scope of this video. So that's two problems that Cardano is solving. And then there's the last and final problem, which is interoperability. Without getting too into the weeds of this, interoperability is the pursuit of creating some universal language that allows the crossover of blockchains. So right now, for example, crypto is almost like a zero sum game, right? I mean, you've heard of it. Buy Bitcoin, buy Ethereum, buy Dogecoin. It's almost like the winner has to take it all. But what if you could create a technology that was fluid like water and that it can exist within and outside of its own blockchain by working well with others? The best real world use case of this is Amazon's AWS, which is just a technology that allows other companies outside of Amazon to integrate it into itself, which allows them to scale easier and quicker and actually helps them without destroying the network, the security of Amazon itself. What if a cryptocurrency could do that? That's what Cardano is trying to work on with things like side chains and other concepts that I'm just not gonna dive into today because it's way too deep. But that is why I like Cardano because it's a team player. It's not a maximalist. It doesn't have the winner take all mentality. And that is why people are calling it Crypto 3.0. But what is Crypto 3.0? Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. There's Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3 type of cryptocurrencies. Now, Gen 1 are things like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, etc. The cryptocurrency that was the first one to invent the blockchain, obviously Bitcoin. But the argument is that it's slow, it's expensive, it's clunky, and it's outdated. But Bitcoin is still number one. And the reason for that is because it doesn't have to be all these crazy things and smart money. It can only do one thing and one thing well, which is to be a store of value, but that's all it needs to do to be successful, which is why it is. And then there's Gen 2. This is Ethereum, smart programmable money. It's cheaper, it's quicker than Bitcoin, but it still uses the same dated decentralization proof of work model. Then there's Gen 3, the new and improved Hyundai Sonata. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but Gen 3 is obviously something like Cardano, which migrates over to proof of stake, which is supposedly the next line of the evolution. So now let's talk about what everyone else is here for, which is price and whether or not I'll buy any. Well, what I personally like about Cardano is the fact that it plays nicely with all the other cryptos for its interoperability, which I think is important in surviving and evolving in today's day and age. Plus the fact that it has a limited finite supply of 45 billion tokens, which means it's a deflationary currency like Bitcoin rather than Ethereum, which is inflationary because it doesn't have a finite supply. So it's almost like Bitcoin and Ethereum had a child and it's Cardano. So here's what I did. I bought 2,592 Cardano tokens just to get the experience because for me, it's sort of like my hedge against Ethereum. And the reason for that is because Ethereum may not do well in the future in case it fails. I feel like people will flock to the cheaper network that is Cardano, which will go through a March upgrade or a hard fork, which will basically allow it to do smart contracts and all the things that Ethereum can do right now, except cheaper. That is how I'm looking at it. It's my hedge against Ethereum. Now in the future, price-wise, I always use $1 trillion as my benchmark because that's 10% of gold's market cap, which Bitcoin already did this year. And I can see at least in the next three to five years, two to three other cryptocurrencies can achieve that as well. It could be Ethereum and or Cardano. But by that math, the market cap of Cardano will multiply about 25X from today's price, bringing the token from $1.30 of today's prices to something like $33 per token, which would bring my initial investment from $3,500 to something like $87,500. So score, except, hold on a minute. Remember that story I told you in the beginning of the video of Blu-ray versus HD DVD? That's to say that it's not necessarily the best technology that wins the game, but instead the ecosystem of developers that could potentially tip the scales in your favor. But really the biggest reason why I told you that story is because the conclusion to that epic saga, that epic fight, was that Netflix came along and digitized everything. So just when you think you know where we're going, you can be potentially disrupted and we can go in a whole different direction. So that is why I fully expect this investment to go to zero dollars, which is why this is not an investment. It's a speculative bet that I made so that you wouldn't have to just to see where we're going. But if you wanna invest your money, you should always put your money into cash flow or cash producing assets rather than these speculative bets of cryptocurrencies, which 
could go to zero or they could go to the moon. Just be responsible and be careful. If you wanna get started with actual real investing, then go get two free stocks with Webull. By depositing $100, you'll get two free stocks valued up to $1,850 each. And if you wanna track those stocks, my spreadsheet is down below in my Patreon. And if you wanna get up to $250 worth of free Bitcoin, you can use this blockfi.com forward slash Andre link where you can get some free Bitcoin. And in the meantime, love you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you back here on Monday and Friday, sometimes a Wednesday. Go Cardano. Let's go to the moon. Bye-bye.